We're continuing a series on I choose. And, uh, you know, the iPhone and the iMac and the uh, iPad and the iPod. And so I thought, you know, we'd just talk about I choose. And so we've been saying that, that, that uh, when you make a choice, really your choice makes you. Think about that. You are free to choose, but you're not free to, uh, to choose the consequences of your choice, right? So whatever you choose, you're free to do. Man is a free moral agent. We can choose to do whatever we want to do, but we cannot unchoose the consequences. So really, you make the choice, then your choice makes you. And we've been talking about the different things that we need to choose. I choose prayer. I choose joy. You've got to choose these things. I choose to pray. I choose joy. I choose uh, prosperity. Pastor preached on that last Wednesday night. Uh, I choose worship uh, a, few, a few Wednesdays ago and several ones that we talked about that you can see if you missed any of them. And so tonight I want to talk to you about Christmas. Have you noticed that it's getting to look a lot like Christmas? And so I want to speak to you if you'd stand with me tonight on I choose Christmas. And uh, you'll see what I'm talking about here later in this message. And I'm going to give you four words that describe Christmas. Four words that describe Christmas. I choose Christmas. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. If you're there, say amen. If you're there, say amen. See if your neighbor's got it. All right, all right. And if you don't have it in your Bible, it's above, above uh, my head back here. And re let's read it out loud. Ready, read. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called, say it out loud, Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now, Father, thank you tonight for the free choice and we choose Christmas. We choose to celebrate it. We choose to consecrate it. We choose to uh, per perpetuate it, Lord, to the next generation. Thank you, Lord, for Christmas. And thank you for coming as a child uh, so that we could live forever as your sons and daughters. We give you the praise in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. And as you're being seated, tell somebody I choose to be nice to you. I choose to be nice to you. Now, if you've been in the Black Friday shopping and you've been in the traffic, you have to choose to be nice. Amen. Don't you love Christmas? Amen. I love Christmas. I'm telling you, I'm, I, I love Christmas. I love Christmas. I'm not ashamed of Christmas. Now, where did we get the word Christmas from? Well, it's shortened from uh, the Roman Catholic Church, Christ's Mass. You know, they celebrate the, the, uh, the breaking of the bread every week. Uh, they call it the Mass, Christ's Mass. And so uh, many centuries ago, on December the 25th, the Roman Catholic Church set aside that date to celebrate the birth of Jesus. And the reason they did this is because on December the 21st, it is the um, the the time when the sun begins to to get longer. In other words, it's the ending of the shortest day of the year. So it begins to begin from that day, December twenty first, to um, till I believe uh, is it June the twenty first. The days begin to get longer and longer. So the pagans would take December the twenty first, and they would go in these wild parties, and they would worship the sun god, the S-U-N god. On December 21st, every year, pagans would do terrible things. They would do, uh, uh, when we think of party, we think of having a good time. They would, they would kill people and sacrifice people. It would be terrible. And they would do all of these things on December the 21st to worship the sun, S-U-N god. And so the early church father said, well, what we're going to do is we're going to take a day close to this celebration and instead of worshiping the S-U-N, we're going to worship the S-O-N. And so this is what they did. So December 25th gave enough time between December 21st for things to calm down and for them to change the focus from the S-U-N, from the pagans, the S-U-N, to 
Jesus Christ, the S-O-N. Now, uh, it's a day to celebrate when the light of heaven became the light of the world. And so, I want you to think about this, that uh, people, have, people every now and then will make crazy statements about Christmas. I mean, they'll come up with all kinds of ideas why we shouldn't celebrate Christmas, they say, because it was a pagan celebration. No, it was never a pagan celebration. It was actually to counter a pagan celebration. Christmas was all about Jesus from the very beginning. And so, and they say this and that and the other, and, you know, poo-poo this and la-la that and, and uh, let the heathen rage, let the people imagine a vain thing and somebody's always was going to come up with some excuse, uh, but but it never was pagan. It was all about the Lord, and uh, and so it went from uh, from celebrating the S U N God to celebrating the S O N, the true God. Now here's the thing: it went in response to paganism. But if you're not if we're not careful, we're seeing that Christmas is starting to go back towards paganism. Are you are you hearing me tonight? You know, more and more, it's getting politically incorrect uh, to, to have Christmas. So it started out as a pagan celebration on the 21st. The Christians changed it on December 21st to a holy celebration. And now it's going back to an unholy celebration. As even in the Wilson Daily Times, I was reading the paper just a few days ago. And it just struck me wrong. It hit a holy nerve in my body. That the city of Wilson is going to cut on, listen to this, the winter lights. Did y'all see that? And I was like, wait a minute, winter lights? I thought, I thought maybe they were doing something about a frosty snowman or some winter park. And I got to look in further, and it's what we call the Christmas lights. They are now calling it the winter lights. And I'm telling you, it's going back to paganism if we're not careful. So we need to make a choice here and right now that we choose the true meaning of Christmas. It's not, it's not winter break, it's Christmas break. It's not happy Hanukkah or happy Kwanzaa. If you celebrate those things, that's fine. We don't discount anybody's celebration, but we're not going to promote that and put the, the real reason for the season down. Uh, I choose Christmas. Uh, I choose to worship. I choose to praise Him. I choose the star of Bethlehem and the nativity scenes. Give the Lord another hand of praise. I choose Christmas. Uh, Sarah Palin wrote about a school right here, and she has a book that I encourage you to get called Good Tidings and Great Joy, Protecting the Heart of Christmas by Sarah Palin. You remember Sarah Palin was the uh, vice presidential candidate, and, and she mentions in her book uh, how the Western Piedmont Community College right here in North Carolina on the western side of the state in Morganton, North Carolina, how they every year they sold Christmas trees to raise money for charity. But a few years ago, they said they're no longer called Christmas trees. They're called holiday trees. Oh, let me tell you something. Uh, it it kind of reminds me about a Christmas play. And, and Sister Darnell, you'll like this. It, I heard about a Christmas play a church was having, and the little children were dressed up as shepherds, wise men, you know. And the highlight of the Christmas play was to show the radiance of Jesus. So an electric bulb was put in the manger, and the stage lights were to be turned off, leaving only the manger lit up. And so, uh, at the appropriate times, sure enough, as planned, all the lights went out, but the manger light uh, never cut on. And the silence was broken when one of the little kids, one of the little shepherd's boy, looked and said to his friends, Hey, they turned off Jesus. <laughs> My friend, we don't need to turn off Jesus or the light of Christmas. Amen? We need to choose to worship Jesus. And to praise and promote Christmas. Did you know that Charlemagne the Great was crowned on December the 25th? Did you know that William the Conqueror of England was also crowned on Christmas Day, December the 25th? Well, I believe this December the 25th and every day we are to choose Christmas uh, and crown him King of Kings uh, and Lord of Lords. Uh, and if we don't have him as 
as our focus. It won't be a holy day. It'll be an unholy day. But this is a holy day, a holiday. His name is Jesus, the one who came on Bethlehem, the reason for the season. And if you don't have Jesus, here's another one. You'll have hallow, ho, excuse me, hollow days instead of a holiday. Amen. Without Jesus, it's hollow. But with Jesus, it's wonderful. And will you choose Christmas? Will you choose him this year? If you will, give him a hand of praise here tonight. Amen. Amen. I want to give you four words that describe Christmas that you often hear at Christmas. And I want to explain to you what those words are. You may already know what they are. I'm sure you do. But um, I hear them a lot during Christmas until I did some uh, research on it. I, I didn't really understand the fullness of the meeting. And the first word, number one, is the incarnation. Somebody say incarnation. So what, when we use the word incarnation, that's a kind of a big word that we don't use a lot. Um, but it is often heard in Christmas. It's a theological term. And basically it means the embodiment of a deity or spirit in earthly form. Or the union of divinity with humanity in Christ Jesus. In other words, the incarnation means God in flesh on earth. So when you hear the word incarnate or the incarnation, we're talking about God literally stepping from planet heaven to planet earth. And he made it even a greater step than that from, from, <laughs> from the other world to this world to your world. Amen. That's the incarnation, how Jesus became a physical human being. And look at 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. And it says, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Say that with me. God was manifest in the flesh. That's Christmas. I choose Christmas. What a joy that Jesus, listen, he was not just a baby. He was God in the flesh. Now, how did this come about? How did, the, how did God, what means, what methods, how did God come from heaven to earth? He came through Mary, his earthly mother, through the virgin birth. Now, let me talk for a few moments about the virgin birth. You see, if there were no virgin birth, if Jesus had a regular father and had been, been born of a regular mom and dad relationship, he would have not qualified as the son of God. He would not have been able to take our sins. He was born of a virgin. It was a miracle. Uh, Mary had not had any normal relationships with, with the opposite sex. And so God literally came into her in, the, in, the, in her womb and she gave birth to him like a natural baby, but he was, uh, had an unnatural conception. The virgin birth. Now, if you don't have the virgin birth, then you can take the Christmas tree down. If there's no virgin, if some people teach, well, Mary and Joseph were married and they just had a baby. You know, if you did that, take your Christmas tree down, take your gifts back to Walmart because there's no reason to celebrate. Amen. Well, how do you know there was a virgin birth? Well, uh, look at Matthew chapter one, verse 16. It says, I'm going to give you these proofs for the virgin birth. And um, it says that Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Now look at that scripture. It says that Jacob had Joseph. And then it didn't say, and Joseph had Jesus. It says Jacob had Joseph, who was the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Every genealogy in the Bible, go to Chronicles if you feel, if you're very uh, uh, not able to sleep. Turn to 1 Chronicles and start reading chapter 1, verse 1. And Adam begot, uh, 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 Lord, what's the, I don't forgot, I'm falling asleep now. Uh, Adam begot, uh, what's the one that got killed? Seth and Enos and, and Methuselah and all that and you're going to sleep. And this one begot this one, this one begot this one, this one begot but only in, in this passage do you see it abruptly stop from Jacob begot Joseph. And women are very rarely mentioned in genealogies. Extremely rare. There's only a, one or two places that women are mentioned. Both are in the New Testament. 
which tells you that in the New Testament, God elevates the, the position of the woman that male and female have equal standing before they're, they're, they are separate genders. So don't, don't extrapolate that scripture. There is still a physical male and physical female, but in God's standing, uh, he doesn't use our gender uh, to, to qualify us for his service. And, and all of you ladies say amen to, to that tonight. But here's one of them. And Jacob begot Joseph and Joseph uh, was the husband of Mary of whom was born Jesus. Now look at Matthew chapter 2 verse 13. Matthew chapter 2 verse 13. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt. That's a proof of the virgin birth. Why? Why? Because notice what the angel, no, if this had been a normal couple, what would the angel have said? The angel would have said, Joseph, Take your wife and son and go to Egypt. No, that's not what he said. The angel said, Joseph, take the young child and his mother and go into Egypt. You see that subtle little reference? No one, every other situation, it would have been, Joseph, take your wife and your son and go. But this was not a normal birth. This was not a normal family. This was not a normal thing because God was up to something and that was to save the world. And he came uh, through the virgin. And also uh, look at every reference and you'll also see that the child is mentioned before the mother. And really, the way it should be, you should mention mother and then the child, right? That's uh, Melissa and her daughter, uh, Kimberly, right? Um, uh, that's, I'm trying to think of y'all's children's name, and it's slipping my mind now. All right? So, you always think of the, the, the parent, and then you call the child. But this, in several instances, it's the child, the young child, or the child, or the baby, and then the mother. Can y'all say amen tonight? Amen. Now, there was a curse that was on King Jehoiakim. Joseph, Jesus' foster father, was a direct descendant of King Jehoiakim. Now look at Jeremiah chapter 22 and verse 30. Look at this very, maybe you haven't heard of this curse, but it says, Thus saith the Lord, write ye this man childless, a man shall not prosper in his days, and no man of his seed shall prosper, seated upon the throne of David. King Jehoiakim had sinned so bad that he was a, he was a descendant of David, and he was a king of Israel, or Judah particularly. He sinned so bad that God said, curse his, none of his descendants will sit on the throne of, of David. Joseph was a direct descendant of King Jehoiakim. So if Joseph had been naturally born of Joseph, if Joseph had been the natural father of Jesus, then the curse would have been continued and Jesus could not legally have reigned on the throne of David. But notice, however, that Jesus did not come naturally through Joseph. He came supernaturally through Mary. Now, let me tell you something about Mary. Uh, Mary, she was also a descendant of David, but from a different line. And because she was also a son of David, and because, she also, because there was no curse on that line... Because he was a natural born uh, child of Mary in the natural sense, though not the supernatural sense. He was God. That way he bypassed the curse. So I'm just telling you, if he had not been born of a virgin, he could have not uh, been king of Israel. But because he was born of a virgin and came through M Mary, another line of David, uh, he's able to sit on the throne of David. Uh, he is the prince of peace. Uh, and uh, The government shall be upon his shoulder and of his kingdom. Uh, there will be no end. Uh, he is the virgin born son of God. Would you give him a hand of praise here tonight? Silent night, holy night, uh, round your virgin mother and child amen somebody said it like this Jesus is the only baby ever born who had an earthly mother but no earthly father he had a heavenly father but not a heavenly mother he is the only baby ever born who is older than his mama and is as old as his daddy Woo! that went over my head now I'm the one that wrote it down Nobody like Jesus. Thank you, sister. That was perfect. He had a heavenly father, but not a heavenly mother. He's the only baby ever born who was older than his mother and as old as his father. Somebody say the incarnation. God came down, and I choose Christmas because of that miracle. Can you say amen? 
There's another word that, that we often hear at Christmas time called the epiphany or epiphany. Now, I had to do some study on this because I had heard the word, but I wasn't familiar enough with the word. didn't understand what it meant. But what does the word epiphany mean? It simply means appearing. Say the word appearing. So um, it can be the appearance or manifestation, particularly in relation to a divine being. Or it could be a revealing scene uh, or moment. Um, you know, I had my epiphany that I was about to get a raise on my job. Or I had this epiphany that, that you know, this thing was going to happen. So it's, it's also an appearing or a revealing of something that perhaps was shocking or not expected. So think of the wise men. This is where we get the epiphany from. Uh, you remember the Bible says, go to Matthew chapter 2 verse 10. Matthew chapter 2 verse 10. It says, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with what? Great joy. So that was an epiphany. Uh, they're searching, they're looking, uh, they've studied, they've prepared, they know something is about to happen, and boom, there it is, the appearing of the star. And that star led them to the bright and the morning star. And by the way, you can't see a star unless it's at night. And don't discount the night seasons. And I know that Christmas can be a struggle sometimes, but I promise you that you can rejoice. You have to choose to rejoice because it's in the darkness that you see the star. And when they saw the star, they did what? They rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And I'll tell you that the star is still shining in your heart and in your life and in this world and this church. I know it's getting darker and I know things are, are getting worse, but I choose Christmas because I have seen, I have had my epiphany. I have seen the star and I've said, where is the king? We have come to worship him. Can you say amen tonight? Amen. So, um, really, the Roman Catholic Church celebrated the epiphany that, on their calendar. Now, we don't go by the Roman Catholic calendar, but some of you have heard of this song, The Twelve Days of Christmas. So, the Twelve Days of Christmas was from January 25th uh, to January 5th. Oh, excuse me. De excuse me. December 25th. To January 5th. And my grandmother used to talk about the celebrating of the old Christmas or the old Christmas date. I've heard that uh, over the years. And I didn't understand what they were talking about. But really, uh, it was the celebration of the epiphany. If you look on your calendar, you'll see January the 6th is the celebration of, these, of when the wise men saw the star. They had that epiphany. And so it is a moment. Uh, and so it was a moment when they saw the star and they knew that Jesus Christ uh, was born. And... I want to ask you a question tonight. Have you seen that star? Have you had an epiphany? Have you come to that moment in which you suddenly realize, uh, wow, I need Jesus. Uh, I know the way I'm going is not the right way. Uh, the Bible says, unto you is born this day in the city of David. He is your epiphany. He belongs to you. Uh, he's the Savior of the world, uh, but he's the Savior of your soul. Uh, and you need to celebrate and choose Christmas because of that. Give him another hand of praise here tonight. Amen. You ever heard the word nativity? There's a movie called The Nativity. So what is the nativity? Um, the nativity is literally the, the place where Jesus was born. Native. You know what we, when we refer to, you know, when somebody's born into a particular, you know, I'm a native of Nash County. I was born in Rocky Mount at Nash General Hospital. So I'm a, now in my life, I've pastored different locations. I remember I, my last church that I pastored was, was a, a very unique culture, very unique place down east Carteret County. When you cross this bridge down there, uh, you're going into a different world. I'm telling you, uh, if you're not, if you're not from there, uh, I'm telling you, you know it. Um, just, just tread, tread carefully and, um, be careful what you say and what you do, because I tell you, those, you know, and so when I pastored down there, I was an outsider, and uh, they had a little name for outsiders. They called them um, uh, dit dots, and, and they called them, but there was another word, and I can't remember. Do you remember what it was, Darnell? And you're not paying attention. Dean batters, that's right. 
you about to have an epiphany, amen. <laughs> and and uh, I'm about to see a star too, right? <laughs> <laughs> It's, oh, me and Darnell, you, you, you know, we, we never had, I'm just, I never like to talk about myself while I'm preaching, but, but we never have had children uh, in the home. And so we, we act like kids because we, you know, <laughs> we never were, we never had to put on the adult, you know, like all of the rest of us do to show our kids. So just pardon us. We're still growing up. Amen. Uh, but when you were, you, you were not, I was not native to that area. And they, they actually had a brogue. If you go down, down east, they, they talk different. And, you know, in the book of Isaiah, you know, and stuff like that. I mean, they, they had a brogue to it. And so when I lived down there, I was not p born in that culture. So sometimes uh, I would say little things that to that culture really didn't go right. So the point I'm just trying to tell you is that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. He was not from Bethlehem in the sense that his home was in heaven. Amen. And so the nativity where he was born as a human was in a place called Bethlehem. Oh, little town of Bethlehem. Now I want you to think about that little town of Bethlehem, that nativity where he is a native of. It's a little place. Somebody say a little place. Now, when Prince William and Princess Kate, about three or four years ago, had their first child. And we saw on the news, you know, the hospital and, and the carriages. And we saw the guards. And then we saw mom and dad and the little baby. Jesus wasn't born like that. He was born in a stable, in a manger, not in uh, a, a royal garden palace. Uh, but he was born in a place called Bethlehem and John chapter 1 verse 14 says that the word became flesh and flesh uh, excuse me and the word became flesh and um, and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory as of the glory as of the only begotten of the father full of what now the message paraphrase um that I, I just refer to it. I don't read it. There's a lot of things I don't like about the message. Uh, but there's a lot, of, a lot of wording that Eugene Peterson uh, put in there that it's just, just absolutely wonderful. It's not inspired, but it's, it's, it's sort of like a, a um, paraphrase. But he paraphrases this. Where in the King James it says, the word became flesh. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Eugene Peterson Quotes it like this. The word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. That's the nativity. He moved into the neighborhood. Aren't you glad he moved into the hood? <laughs> Aren't you glad he moved down into the hood here? There's nowhere you can't find him. If he left heaven for earth. Uh, my friend, I'm telling you, it's so that you and I can leave earth for heaven. Uh, thank God that Jesus moved into the neighborhood. That is a, it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. It's a wonderful day in the neighborhood. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? Uh, won't you be my neighbor? I'll tell you, you can't get better than Mr. Rogers when it comes to Jesus. Amen. He moved into the neighborhood. Uh, thank God for the nativity and it is not winter lights. Uh, it's not, uh, uh, some kind of pagan celebration. It is Jesus moving into the hood. And I'm going to celebrate. I choose Christmas. Uh, can you say amen tonight? Amen. So these words, I hope, have greater meaning to you. Amen. I hope that you understand the incarnation, how he became flesh and blood. The epiphany, how he appeared. How he appeared and the soul felt its worth. Oh, holy night. And the nativity, the, the place called Bethlehem. And, and I could work on that a little bit. How that God comes in faraway places. God comes in, in, in uh, places that, that others have not thought about. In small places, God can do big things. Amen? Amen. And let me close with the, the final word I want to uh, highlight to you. Is the word Advent. Now, that's a Christmas word. Have you heard that? An advent, the advent. 
In fact, uh, it's four weeks leading up to Christmas. The four candles, uh, we did those at one of the churches I pastored. We had uh, uh, some folks that were really into the Advent candles and things like that. And I think it's very beautiful and very meaningful. Um, but what does the word Advent mean? Well, have you ever heard of the word adventure? You know, um, so that's not completely what it's about. You know, when we think of an advent or an adventure, you know, sometimes Christmas can be an adventure. <laughs> I mean, you get to driving down Airport Boulevard in certain times of the day, that's an adventure, amen? Uh, you just go down to Walmart on Christmas Eve about 4 o'clock, now that's an adventure. Come on now. Now, when you go home for Christmas and you gather with cousins you haven't seen the whole year, that's an adventure too, amen? Crazy cousins and uh, um, crazy uncles and aunts and, and uh, it's just family, amen? You know, the Adams family, come on now. But the word advent, some of y'all not probably had Christmas like I had, I, 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 you know. My, my, my Christmas growing up was, was, was not, uh, my grandmother was a Christian, I was a Christian, but the rest of them, they weren't Christians. And uh, so, it was an adventure, I promise you. I promise you, I promise you. But we had a good time. We had a good time. Nobody could remember it the next day, but it, we had a good time. And uh, I tell you, I tell you, I have some great Christmas memories. But um, the word Advent just basically means coming. So this is more than an epiphany and, a, and an unveiling or an appearing. The word Advent just means an arrival, coming, an important arrival. How many of you got a package that's arrived? Look at Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. The Bible said, when man sinned, when man sinned, God said, I will put enmity, Genesis 3, 15, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head. Thou shalt bruise his heel. That's the promise of the advent. Did you know Christmas didn't start with the Roman Catholic Church? Christmas didn't start in America. Christmas started in the Garden of Eden when God said, He's coming. He's going to come. The seed of the woman. The virgin birth. Not the seed of the man. But the seed of the woman. Or really more properly. The seed through the woman. Because Jesus didn't come from Mary. He came through Mary. And I want you to understand something. That, that the advent was promised. And all through the prophets. They said he's coming. He's coming. Moses said, a prophet like unto me will, will God raise up to you and you'll hear him and he will deliver you. And you keep looking and you keep looking. And, and even Jacob, when he talked about the scepter shall never depart from Judah nor a lawgiver from between his feet uh, until Shiloh comes. Uh, you see the coming uh, of the advent. The advent, it was coming. He was coming. He was just like these boys. They're coming. They're coming right now. Amen. Perfect timing. Go back to Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. Here's the advent in Micah chapter 5 verse 2. If you're there, say amen. I'm going to read it from the King James. But thou, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth, shall come. Somebody say come. come. That's the advent. That's what we mean by Christmas, the advent, the coming one. He came on that first Christmas. And by the way, here's a little nugget for you. That I picked up a couple of years ago. Notice he was born in Bethlehem. But that's but Micah was more specific. He said. He didn't just say Bethlehem. He said Bethlehem Ephratah. Now you've heard of Wilson. Say amen. But have you ever heard of Sims? Sure you have. Sure you have. But ask somebody who, who's not familiar with Wilson County. They've heard of Wilson. But Sims? They've never heard of Sims. You ask most people. You've heard of Bethlehem, but have you ever heard of Ephrathah? It's very interesting about Ephrathah. Bethlehem, the word Bethlehem, El Bethel, or the God of Bethlehem, Beth, really means you can, you, it's the house of bread. El Bethel, Bethlehem, him, the house of bread. 
So Bethlehem represents bread. And Jesus was born in Bethlehem, and he's the bread of the world. Say amen. But what you may not realize is that if you do study, Brother Tom, Ephrata was the place where they produced grapes and wine. And they were neighboring communities. One was famous for bread. The other was famous for wine. Are y'all getting it yet? Jesus was born bread and the wine. What do we take every now and then? We take the little, the communion, right? It represents the what? The bread and it represents the blood or the wine. So Jesus Christ was, his birth was in a place that per, uh, spoke of his purpose. Uh, he was, he, did, he wasn't born to live. He was born to die so that we could live. Uh, and he came. Uh, that's what the word Advent. He came. Uh, and, uh, but you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, are only a small village among all of Judah. Yet a ruler of Israel shall come from you. One whose origins uh, is from uh, distance past. Uh, from Eden's gates to the Psalms to the prophets. Uh, even to John the Baptist himself said he's coming. And Galatians chapter 4 verse 4, it says, When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman. Oh, thank God I choose Christmas that Jesus Christ came. And it's not winter holiday. It's not, uh, it's, it's not uh, holiday trees. It's Christmas. Christmas. I choose Christmas. He came. So let's give him praise for that tonight. Amen. Now, I got to thinking about how many miles I put on my car or will put on my car for Christmas. So Christmas Eve, I'm going to head over to my mother's house, which is not that far, about 12 miles. So let's say, 20, let's say 25 miles on Christmas Eve. And on Christmas Day, we're going down to the Howell Farm in uh between lagrange and goldsboro and so that'll be i guess about 80 miles so you could probably say let's just say total make it easy let's say 100 miles my christmas i'm gonna put on my car and i'm gonna go 100 miles to celebrate christmas but friend can i tell you how many miles did he come when he left the throne of glory and he traveled all the way to bethlehem ephrathah from Bethlehem, Ephrathah, he went to Jerusalem and crucified. And he died and he traveled all the way down to the gates of hell and took the keys and rose again on the third day. And he traveled back up to glory. But friend, how far did he come to travel to come into your heart and into your life? Do you remember the day when, G when you had your Christmas? Uh, and I'm not talking about December 25th. Uh, I'm talking about when you had your incarnation, when you had your advent, uh, when you had your nativity where he was born right here in your heart, uh, when you had that, that moment uh, where Jesus traveled from, from heaven to earth uh, to take you from earth uh, to heaven. Uh, let's celebrate Christmas. I choose uh, Christmas. Uh, give him a hand of praise here tonight. Amen. And by the way, the Advent speaks of his first coming. But have you ever heard the phrase, the second Advent? What do you mean by that? Well, you know, the first Advent was when? Christmas, 2,000 years ago. Well, the second Advent has yet to happen. Do you know what that is? That's the coming of the Lord. And I promise you, if he came, would you stand with me tonight? If he came the first time, I'm here to tell you, he's going to come the second time. We're looking any day for the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I promise you, when he comes again, you're not going to talk about happy uh, this and happy that and, and holiday lights and holiday trees. You're going to be saying Christmas, uh, Merry Christmas uh, every day for thousands and thousands. Uh, every day will be a Christmas uh, because he is in our heart uh, and the star shines bright uh, and we are in the palm of his hand and no man will pluck us uh, out of his hand. Uh, will you choose Christmas this year? Will you choose to worship? Uh, will you choose to, to, uh, to witness? Uh, will you tell people about the one who came for them? Uh, will you be a witness to your loved ones? Can I, can I get a witness out there tonight? Yeah. Lift your hands and say, I choose Christmas. I choose to celebrate 
I choose to celebrate the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He is coming again. He is coming again. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every Nature sing and heaven, heaven, and nature sing. Oh, joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing. Come on. of his love and wonders of his love 